Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Duke Law Intellectual Property Society's uh, fourth annual Hot Topics in Intellectual Property Symposium. Um, I know that for some of you, uh, this is the first symposium you've attended, but others of you I've recognized from last year. Uh, and I'm glad to see that the symposium is really becoming a regular feature of uh, Duke Law School, and I'm pretty sure it's going to continue. Uh, although the Hot Topics Symposium is our primary focus, uh, the IP Society conducts many other events. Uh, this year especially we focused on collaborating with others, other groups here at Duke Law School, uh, especially with the Center for the, Stu for the Study of the Public Domain, which we've co-sponsored uh, several events with this year and in prior years. Uh, this year as well we've also co-sponsored with the Health Law Society, um, the Sports and Entertainment Law Society, the American Constitution Society, and also uh, Women Law Students Association throughout the year. We've held several events with each of these groups. Um, as well, this year for the first time, uh, we've collaborated with the Duke Law and Technology Review, which is Duke's IP journal, uh, to offer all the presenters the opportunity to publish their talks today. Uh, this, uh, we have the hope that this would uh, mean that the interesting ideas that are raised here today extend beyond just the day of the symposium and are available for people to read in the future. Um, just as a final note, I just want to thank all the people that helped make uh, today possible, especially the Board of the IP Society, which has worked throughout the year uh, to put together all the details uh, for the event. Uh, I'd like to thank also Dean Bartlett, who uh, is one of our sponsors and also has uh, offered a lot of support to the society uh, this year and in years past. Uh, I'd also like to thank Jennifer Jenkins of the Center for the Study of the Public Domain. Uh, she also is one of our sponsors and uh, has offered her IP expertise to help us put together uh, the symposium. And finally, all the sponsors you see on the banner here, uh, Myers Beagle, Pipla, Nelson Mullins, Dowlon, Spore, uh, one of our alumnus, uh, Buck Ferguson, who was instrumental in uh, securing one of our speakers today, uh, Center for the Study of Public Domain I mentioned, Syn Syngenta, Parker Poe, uh, I think that's everyone, and uh, Graduate and Professional Student Council. Uh, so thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, now I think I'll turn it over to Professor Rye, uh, one of our professors here, to uh, introduce the panel. Good morning. Well, as usual, the students have done a great job of putting together a fabulous day. And obviously, I'm going to be focusing on the panel for today, uh, this morning. But um, I also want to highlight the the keynote speaker, George Gilder, and some of the interesting stuff that's taking place this afternoon, discussions on the vexed topic of patent claim construction and the, um, the very salient Grokster case and peer-to-peer -peer, uh, file sharing technology. So. Um, the topic for this morning is just a fabulous topic that is very close to my uh, heart, uh, near and dear to my research interests. And that is the topic of, of software patents versus open source. Each approach, the patents approach and the OS approach, is interesting in and of itself. And the possible, probable clash between these two approaches is also very interesting. As many of you probably know, um, software patents have become routine in the US um, due to various decisions of the Federal Circuit in the 1990s. Interestingly, software patents under the enablement requirement of patent law do not require disclosure of source code, which is quite antithetical, obviously, to the open source movement, which is explicitly grounded on disclosure of source code and depending upon the license scheme licensing scheme used may even require improvers to disclose source code. So here, at, at the very uh, foundation of software patents versus open source, we have a, a little bit of a tension. In addition, both are very prominent phenomena, as you probably know now, um, in the business sector uh, that we have lots of firms that are using open source models to make money, um, not simply Red Hat, which is featured prominently on our panel, but also IBM, um, it has been reported, has made as much as a billion dollars off Linux-related uh, work that it does. So um, it's clearly become a revenue-generating source um, for firms. On the other hand, so have software patents. We've seen tens of thousands of software patents, depending on who you believe, at least tens of thousands of software patents issuing every year. So software patents are obviously very prominent in the business arena as well. Um, and then there's the issue of whether open source infringes some of these software patents. Um, there has been work done by one of our panelists that would suggest that Linux, for example, may infringe several hundred software patents. Um, 
And by the same token, IBM, perhaps responding to some of this work, has recently agreed to quote unquote donate 500 of its software patents to the open source movement. So lots of interesting um, apparent contradictions and clashes in what business thinks of open source, as many of you know. Uh, uh, a counterpart in the software community at IBM, Microsoft, is very opposed to open source. So um, we have uh, some very interesting alignments occurring in this arena. And we, our panel today is just exceedingly well placed to talk about all these complications and contradictions because they are very much in the fray of this debate. So we'll start off with Daniel Egger, who not only is in the fray of this debate, but has created much of the debate through his work as the founder and chairman of Open Source Risk Management, which is the firm that did the quote unquote patent mapping of Linux and suggested that Linux may infringe at least several hundred software patents. As the founder and chairman of OSRM, as it is called, he um, uh, brings um, to the table more than 10 years of experience in commercial software development, risk man management, and finance. He is a graduate of Yale University and Yale Law School and is currently serving as the first Howard John Johnson Foundation Entrepreneur in Business at Duke University. Um, probably one of the things that got him that position is the so-called Babcock Elevator Competition that he founded. It's one of the best known business plan competitions in the country. And this competition requires students to compete in a, in a context where they have two minutes to present their plan while riding 20 floors, 20 floors in an elevator with judges of the competition. And so that's how they, they get to uh, make their presentation in that two minutes. And I, I just found that concept so fascinating that I insisted that um, I, I really wanted to tell you about it. Um, OK, so that's Daniel. Um, next we'll have, and he'll be speaking, by the way, on extrajudicial dispute resolution and the GNU general public license and emerging customary law of, quote, work based on the program, unquote. And since that title is so interesting and I uh, don't even know what that means exactly, work based on the program, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to his talk. Robert Bray is the principal administrator at the Secretariat of the Committee for Legal Affairs at the EU Parliament. And needless to say, he has been intimately involved in the recent um, fray over the debate over the EU software directive, um, whatever that means, um, given that the EU, it looks like, has been issuing software patents for a while now that don't look too different from some of the software patents that are issued in the US. Um, and yet, there has been this big controversy over the EU software directive, which I take it was recently uh, finally adopted. No, no, no. OK, I'm, then I'm just wrong. OK. All right, well, you'll tell us more. <laughs> um, I suppose that, yeah, you would tell us in the what is it, why is it, and where are we now portion of your talk. Well, this is very good. You'll, you'll enlighten me. Um, after uh, Mr. Bray, we'll have Mark Webink speaking, who is the Deputy General Counsel and Secretary of Red Hat, which has already been mentioned, and obviously um, as a, a firm that makes uh, its bu uh, business model uh, is based on open source software, he has a lot to say about this issue. Um, and he will his the topic of his discussion will be a new paradigm for intellectual property rights in software. Mr. Webink uh, joined Red Hat in May of 2000 as, as its first general counsel. Um, and that is now its corporate secretary. He was most recently a distinguished speaker on intellectual property at the UC School of Information Management and Systems. And he is a prominent voice uh, in this open source versus, if we can call it that, software debates uh, controversy. Uh, next we'll have Timothy O'Sullivan, who is a shareholder in the firm of Myers Beagle, Sibley, and Sejovic. Um, I guess we never usually get beyond Myers Beagle, and so that's why that last name is, um, I'm probably mangling it. Um, uh, Tim is a graduate of Duke University. He received his JD from Duke University in 1990, and he is registered to practice before the US PTO 
his practice focuses on computer and electronics technology, and he's been practicing patent law since 1990. Tim has a background in engineering from University of Missouri, Rolla. And finally, last but certainly, and he'll be speaking, excuse me, on patents as a tool to spur innovation, the benefits of patent protection over open source. Slightly provocative title. Um, and then uh, John Conley will be our last speaker speaking on the international law of software patents, Does It Really Matter? He is the William Rand Kennan Professor of Law at UNC Chapel Hill and received his law and anthropology degrees from Duke um, after taking his undergraduate degree in classics from Harvard. He has um, been a very long-term practitioner of intellectual property law, um, practiced for several uh, six years in various parts of the country before joining the UNC law faculty in 1983, where he teaches civil procedure, intellectual property, scientific evidence, biotechnology, professional responsibility, and law and social science. That exhausts me just reading the list. I can't imagine how one actually does all of those things. It is quite daunting. Um, and really, he, he, he's doing active work in all of these areas. In addition to writing extensively on intellectual property, he teaches a course on social science evidence to judges at the University of Virginia's graduate program on judges. And he's also of counsel to the Charlotte law firm of Robinson, Bradshaw, and Hinson. So I hope you will join me in welcoming our speakers. And they will be giving 15-minute presentations seriatim for the first hour and 15 minutes. After that, we'll have a break and then return for a panel discussion, which I'm, I have no doubt will be extremely lively. So without further ado, Dan Egger. Hello, everyone. It's very nice to be here. Um, I was recently on a panel uh, at another open source conference um, where I was the last person on the panel to speak. And um, we had the same setup as this. We had about 15 minutes per person. And by the time they got to me, the panel had been over for about 20 minutes and everyone had left. So I'm going to try really hard not to inflict that on my fellow panelists. Um, Actually, I got the sympathy vote, you know. Um, uh, people hung around afterwards, and I probably got more attention than most of the people who spoke. But um, th this is, we're on a very tight schedule here. So I want to just hit on a few very central introductory points. Hopefully, this will be helpful as, as the other panelists present. Um, just to frame, what is this all about? What is this conflict all about? First of all, there are a lot of normative discussions, should there be software patents? Software patents, are they good policy? Or, OK, maybe they're good policy. Is the way we implement them good policy? Is the way they're issued good policy? None of that is really relevant to looking at the practical business problems today, because software patents are simply a fact. They, they are something that everyone in business must deal with. Just to give you a rough idea, and these numbers are quite approximate, there are about 15,000 15, patents that, um, based on our own review, our, uh, Open Source Risk Management, my, my company, um, that could arguably be said to be on the topic of some part of what this, what's called the LAMP stack. The LAMP stack is the Linux operating system, the Apache web server, the MySQL database, and then depending on who you ask, either the Perl or Python scripting languages. Um, although if you ask Source Labs, it's PHP. So, um, but it's something that starts with, with um, P anyway that's really important. <laughs> and, um, 
there are, um, of those 15,000, about 1,000 um, clearly apply to operating system function. These would be core functions and activities of what an operating system does, interfacing between applications and hardware, memory management, things without which you don't have a computer system. Um, and um, based on our review of those approximately 1,000 patents, there are about 200 that we believe could be used to bring colorable claims against the Linux kernel. Th that does not mean that we think that these patents would be upheld. In fact, the majority of them are um, relatively flimsy by the standards of patent drafting in other topic domains. And even looking at patents in a general, about 50% are invalidated um, it, of those that go all the way to um, adjudication of, of validity on, on the merits. Um, but nevertheless, to suggest that there are a lot of patents out there by, um, by, by lay people standards, there's a lot of patents out there that could potentially be used to cause trouble. I think most patent litigators would look at this list and say, how did you ever come up with such a short list? Um, so patents are a fact, and corporate reliance upon the Linux operating system is a fact. Uh, Gardner Group recently put out a study uh, suggesting that by 2008, there would be $35 billion in annual sales of applications that run on top of the Linux operating system. So this is not even uh, a measure of the real value of open source software. This is a value of proprietary software that runs on top of the Linux operating system. Uh, th that, that reflects perhaps the um, sheer economic force of Linux and open source software. Um, it's already the case that the majority of commercial web systems run on primarily on the Apache web server on Linux. A um, number of large companies, in particular IBM and Oracle, have made major strategic commitments to making their proprietary applications run very well with the open source Linux operating system, suggesting they believe the two can coexist. Um, and and um, if you talk with IT directors, CIOs, Associate General Counsels for Technology at Global 2000 Companies, you'll find that they may or may not have formal Linux policies. They may or may not have decided what their official view on Linux is, but they're using it. So um, there, there's clearly some kind of opposition between patents and open source. So to my mind, the real interesting question is where there's opposition, there may be an accommodation or there may be conflict. And the question is, is, is conflict inevitable? Arguing in favor of no, conflict is not inevitable, is that the Linux operating system has been available for 14 years in various forms. During that entire time, it's been available under the same license, the GNU GPL, General Public License. There has never been a publicized patent litigation against the software. There has never been a um, public settlement, there's never been a public adjudication of a patent claim against Linux. So from one point of view, um, this is one of the safest things in the world you could do. What could be safer than to use, uh, to do something that for 14 years, tens of millions of people have done, and none of them have ever been sued? Okay. Arguing on the other side is the simple fact that big money is now involved. If you look back on those 14 years, only in about the last two years has the amount of economic activity around Linux gotten into the multiple billions and tens of billions of dollars. And we all know that plaintiff's lawyers go where the money is, just like bank robbers, and they are likely to pursue uh, a target that has deep pockets. So what has changed is that deep pockets are now part of the equation. And a lot of very large and very wealthy corporations are using Linux as part of their underlying operational systems, and they don't want to take it out. 
and that means that they are vulnerable to nuisance suits, they're vulnerable to um, needing to resolve patent claims on a, for, for settlement value. Um, it just creates a whole new situation. The other issue that argues that there may be conflict is that the, although the open source license says vary a great deal, the license that um, the Linux operating system is made available under has very clear provisions forbidding distributors to enter into patent settlements that require per copy payments from downstream distributees. And for the moment, I'm not going to go into exactly what all that means. Suffice it to say that um, normal, typical, conventional resolution of patent litigations can prevent a distributor from further distribution of Linux. So I'm going to really try not to go over my 15 minutes. But here's a few of the better arguments for why there will be no conflict. First of all, the operating system code is non-infringing. It's essentially non-infringing. That, that, that's right. It's essentially non-infringing. And the reason why Linux, the operating system, is essentially non-infringing is that Linux is a clean room re-implementation of the Unix operating system APIs. What that means is that it is built according to well understood operating system principles published in books by people like Tannenbaum, published in textbooks, and written to open and available standards for system calls so that, in theory at least, a Unix application that uses only standard system calls will run on Linux. Because of this, most of the technology in Linux is more than 20 years old. It's, it was obsolete when they started in 1991. Okay. Is it also incredibly fast, efficient, cutting edge? Yes, of course. But the reality is that operating systems themselves have been around for a long, long time. It's a very well understood technology. And what that means is that if you run into areas of infringement, you can almost always engineer around the infringement and re-implement comparable functionality in a non-infringing way. So aren't I convincing that there's really no problem? Okay. The, the, the second major argument you'll hear is that the patents that are out there are not very strong. They're not very good. They're not very persuasive. For a whole lot of reasons, in the United States, when we started with software patents, patent examiners did not have the tools. They didn't have the prior art databases. They didn't have the personal experience, because initially patent examiners were not people who grew up developing software. They came with other engineering backgrounds. And they didn't have the um, database of prior patents, which is a huge part of prior art in most areas, to rely upon in doing research. So a lot of patents got approved where um, if you're an engineer, you might look at them and say, gee, I really think there is, um, there's prior art there. Okay. There's major economic interest now at stake in defending Linux, particularly um, IBM um, and, and um, the Linux developers themselves um, are very, very unlikely to um, roll over in the event of litigation. And most of us can probably ride on their coattails and get for free the benefit of their efforts to keep their markets open. Finally, you have the issue that Microsoft is bluffing. Microsoft has been telling people in private conversations and not so private conversations and semi-private conversations that some open source software infringes some of their patents and they don't want to say which ones and they don't want to say which software, but they would like a license, please. Uh, and they've, uh, Steve Ballmer has been going around quoting OSRM study saying, oh, there's 283 patents that potentially uh, are infringed by Linux and so on. Um, th this is probably a bluff. And the reason why it's probably a bluff is that Microsoft, A, does not want to sue its best customers. B, runs the risk of a kind of 
mutual assured de de destruction Armageddon meltdown in which multiple companies with huge patent portfolios start suing one another. Um, and finally, is probably aware that um, its position as a monopoly a a established by law, this is res judicata, that it is a monopoly, um, will cause people to look at its aggressive enforcement of patents quite differently than a typical company. Okay. Why yes? And I'm going to go a little faster. There's just too much money on the table. It, when there's this much money, plaintiff's lawyers get creative. Second, it only takes one. Let's say the vast majority of the patents are weak. The vast majority of plaintiffs are easily persuaded not to pursue. Um, those practicing the art, like Microsoft, all decide it's not worth it. All you need is one non-practicing entity with one claim that gets settled to create a lot of havoc with the general public license because you have the problem that whoever has entered into that license, assuming that it has per copy royalties, is, is no longer able to distribute. Finally, all the arguments for no are, are true but irrelevant. All right, this is a little complicated. Maybe we'll get into this more later. Um, basically, the general public license was written with an awareness that patents are the greatest threat to open source software. It was written in 1991 in its current form with an awareness that if anything was going to kill open source software, it was going to be patents. And so they built into the license a structure that says, you may not compromise with the patent system. If you do, you may not use the software that has been provided to you. So a lawyer typically thinks, well, OK, I'll just ignore that provision, and I'll pay some economic damages. Remember, uh, you probably all heard about efficient breach in torts class. Well, the problem here is that those that contributed the code, the copyright holders in the code, do not believe that the GPL is a contract. And they have a 14-year history of literally dozens and dozens of real live disputes that have been resolved in the absence of litigation supporting their position. So it is not the case, although there, it is the case that there are very few, practically no, clear adjudications of the copyright implications of the, quote, work based on the program or derivative work language of the general public license. What we have is a practical situation on the ground where those that have to make everyday decisions around this license know that the view of the copyright holders is that if you infringe the license, your copyright permission is terminated, and they will withdraw your ability to use the software. And a number of them, including Richard Stallman, who's the author of the General Public License and the founder of the Free Software Foundation, has said repeatedly and demonstrated in his actions that he will not settle for money. He wants specific performance. You either have to open source the entire code base if you create a derivative work with his code in it, or you have to stop using it, stop distributing it. And um, because he wrote the libraries, which are these essential little routines that get absorbed into applications, including the kernel, um, even if kernel authors decided they wanted to compromise, that wouldn't be good enough. Because you can't run the kernel without the libraries. They are part of the operating system. So in our view, there's only one rational solution to this. Um, looming conflict, and that is user-based collective defense. It needs to be user-based because users are the only ones that can settle permissibly under the general public license. It makes sense to pass price in, and here you see my Yale Law background and you know Guido Calabresi and all that. It's very obvious to my classmates where this comes from. You just price in the aggregate cost of compliance with all patents into users' expense in using the software because they are the most rational and efficient carriers of that cost. And they have the greatest incentive to find third parties who will act as their agents to manage those costs. This is why open source risk management was organized, is to act as an agent for end users to manage their compliance costs. We've looked at what these compliance costs are. What would it actually cost to deal with the nuisance litigation, to resolve claims, and to act as 
uh, an insurance company's agent on behalf of end users of the Linux operating system. And our estimates are that it can be done successfully, efficiently, profitably for about $60 per server. So if you look at the current costs of proprietary software, um, you ought to be able to build a Linux-based stack for the enterprise that is 25 to 30 percent cheaper than a proprietary alternative, including legal protection and addressing the patent costs. And that's everything I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I'd like to start by um, saying what a great honor it is to be here at Duke, uh, whose fame has spread across the pond to Europe. Um, I've got a fast topic to cover. I've got 15 minutes. I can't possibly cover it. Um, I've arranged for a handout to be produced, which contains in it most of the substantive provisions which are under debate in the European Parliament and in the European Union at the present. So if you'd like to refer to that, I'm always around afterwards to answer, answer any questions. Uh, what well, I should make it clear, first of all, that I am an official, a civil servant of the European Parliament. Therefore, I'm not a politician, and I have to take a strictly neutral, objective view on this. But I can tell you what entertaining things have been going on. I would also like to convey my apologies from Arlene McCarthy, the um, member of the European Parliament, who would have been here to speak today, but um, I was her collaborator in drawing up her report, so she felt it was appropriate for me to come. So, first of all, you need to understand a little bit about European constitutional law, how this thing works. Um, what happens in the European Union is that the Commission of the European Communities is, is the only body which can produce a proposal for legislation. The European Parliament cannot initiate legislation. So you get a proposal, which we did in 2002, it then goes to the European Parliament and simultaneously to the Council. The Council is the ministers of the member states. The European Parliament is a directed, directly elected body of about 700 members, now from 25 member states. That body uh, deals with legislation, proposals for legislation like this in committees, select committees, the committee in this case being the Legal Affairs Committee, Legal Affairs and Internal Market Committee at the time. Um, and we have the right to amend the legislation, ultimately to reject it. This goes through two readings, th or three. So, at the moment, what has happened? We've had a proposal from the European Commission. We've given a first reading on it. Then what happens is you wait for the Council to come up with their position, which is called a common position, because it's a position common to all the member states. It's reached by a qualified majority vote, which is a complicated matter, which I cannot go into now. Um, this is, by the way, called the co-decision procedure, which doesn't apply to all community legislation. Um, basically, it's legislation concerned with the functioning of the internal market, which is a market without frontiers. Now, the common position is adopted by the Council, and then it comes back to Parliament for another reading. At any time on the way, it's possible to reach agreement. It could be voted through. After that, if... If the Council and the Parliament cannot agree, they sit down in what's called a conciliation committee and they try and work out their differences. They have a limited time to do this. And by the way, second reading itself is limited to three months and time started a month ago. Um, if they cannot settle their difference, if they can settle their differences, it still has to go to a vote in the Council in the European Parliament. And the Parliament then has the right to reject completely the proposal and if the Commission wants to go ahead with it, they have to come out with a new one. This has happened on several occasions. Right. This is a very simple and crude representation of it. I do have in my paper a very crude examination of uh, how, what, how patents differ from um, the situation in the US. At European level, and you have to bear in mind that you can have patents granted by an individual member state under its own legislation, or they can do it under the European Patents Convention. 
Um, the European Patent Convention provides that in order to be patentable, an invention has to be susceptible of industrial application, new, and involve an inventive step. An invention is new if it doesn't form part of the state of art, of the art, and an invention is regarded as involving an inventive step if, having regard to the state of the art, it's not obvious to a person skilled in the art. Industrial ap application means that the invention can be made or used in any kind of industry, including agriculture. Um, if these conditions are met, a patent can be granted for 20 years, which compares with life plus 70 years in Europe in the case of a copyright. It should be noted that the convention expressly provides that discoveries, mathematical methods, schemes, rules, and methods for performing mental acts, playing games or doing business, and programs for computers and presentations of invention for of information are not patentable. It should be noted also there is a procedure for objecting to the grant of a given patent in the European Patent Organization in Munich. Hence, there is an existence of bodies called boards of appeal and a substantial body of case law. So, from that, you might think that computer programs aren't patentable. Well, you'd be wrong, because the European Patent Office has granted more than 30,000 software-related patents since 1978, and many of these, it is alleged, relate to business methods like inventions and algorithms. And they largely do this by reviewing the invention as a process. An example is the Viacom case, where the Board of Appeal granted a patent for a method and apparatus for improved digital image processing on the ground that the claim was directed to a technical process in which the method used does not seek protection for a mathematical method as such. So what in fact they do, and the national courts, and the two main, you have to bear in mind that most patents um, are granted in English these days, even though there's a requirement for translation, and the most active patent courts are in the UK and in Germany, partly because of the perceived quality of the judicial, judicial system in those countries, particularly in Germany. So these courts and the EPO took the view that computer-implemented inventions, which is the expression used to avoid saying software patents, may be regarded as patentable when they have a technical character. That is to say, when they belong to a field of technology. In fact, in the case called Computer Program Product 1 and 2, a very colourful name, the Board of Appeal held that a program on a data carrier, a disk, has the potential to produce a technical effect when run on a computer. The program itself should not be excluded from patentability. The problem with this is it's only too easy to say that as soon as you stick a diskette into the computer, that you're already in a field of technology and therefore the software is patentable. We should make all software patentable. So what did the Commission's proposal seek to do? It sought to create a uniform set of rules based on the practice of the European Patent Organization's Board of Appeals. Why? In order to have uniform European rules in order to avoid divergences in the interpretation of the convention itself and in national law, because remember, you can still have patents granted under national law. They thought this would conduce to greater legal certainty and would allow the EU to satisfy its obligations under TRIPS, the Convention on Trade-Related International Property Rights. Um, it's, it's been felt also by some that we need more clarity in this area, that uh, there is a political feeling that with traditional metal bashing industries and others going to the east, that how the hell are we going to make our living? If you read Ms. McCarthy's report, she makes this point very strongly and that we need intellectual property and we need to be able to enforce other countries to respect our intellectual property if we are going to have the money to live off. There are other people as well who suggest that 
Look, we've been through all this before. You know, patentability of biotechnological inventions, chemicals, other things in the past. This is just something the patent system has to go through. We have a big battle against the Luddites, and then we come through it. Some people say, that, OK, you know, everything's electronic these days. Why not patent software? This is an extreme view. Commission's view was not that extreme at all, but it certainly raised considerable fears in the open source community. Um, and here came an interesting phenomenon. I was at a conference the other day in which the Commission was proposing to bring out harmonized provisions on normal contractual, contra contractual terms, contract terms, so we could have standard contract terms at European community level. And a, and a university professor said, brilliant, so how can we do a piece of legislation in such a way that the politicians can't interfere with our carefully selected wording? You know, we're all university professors, we know what we're talking about, we can't let those guys loose on it. And it was much the same here, but the Commission knew very well what it was doing. It was backed by the European Patent Office, it was backed by the UK Patent Office, the German Patent Office, the courts, everything. But what they didn't reckon on was there was an election coming up to the European Parliament that politicians don't like it when individuals ring up and say, hey, you know, we're local computer programmers here, small business, I'm running a, a business out of my back, a shed in my back garden, and I've got to vote, you know? And these guys got together, and I must say, admire them for their incredibly energetic lobbying and so there's a website which I cite in my paper, which is well worth visiting, which gives you the whole history of this. Here again, we've had a situation in which open source has been flourishing. To my knowledge, there has been no litigation, there has been no challenge to any open source software on the grounds it's infringing on patent in Europe. However, open source says, basically, Software should be patented by copyright alone. Uh, it's too expensive to obtain a patent. A patent lasts too long. In the nature of things, you know, 20 years is ridiculous when you consider the ephemeral nature and the fast-changing technological environment that we live in now. And they say it's high, not only expensive to get a patent, it's very expensive to defend one. And you get phenomena like patent thickets and people that just purchase patents as a speculation so that they can bring litigation against you when they've got no intention of using the patents themselves. They also identified a large number of patents granted by the European Patent Organization as being for pure business methods. Now, what the what, uh, without going into detail, it's all in the handout. The Commission's proposal basically says that you have to have a technical contribution in addition to the other requirements of novelty and um, inventive step and industrial application. So they tried to build in wording which would make this possible. As, as a, a sop, perhaps, to the open source movement, they threw in a provision, which is Article 6 of its original proposal, which says that which allows a certain amount of decompilation for the, for the sake of interoperability. So in the first reading, um, Arlene McCarthy and I sat down and studied this, and we tried to tighten it up. We thought, Ms. McCarthy thought the approach was right, and we decided to try and make it clear to, to the general public and to the legislature what was not patentable. So we, we, we made it clear, we hoped that business methods were not, per se, were not patentable. We tried to make it clear when you could have a patent based on, a, on an algorithm. An algorithm itself cannot be patented, but when it could. And if you read the documents, you will see that. Uh, there are also some provisions to try and make it clear how you should assess a technical contribution in terms of the claims. This is Article Six, uh, Amendment 16 in her article. Um, 
I recommend you read that to understand what it's about. I just haven't got time to go through it now. Um, we also put in a new article that provides that member states shall ensure that whenever the use of a patented technique is needed for the sole purpose of ensuring conversion of the conventions used in two different computer systems or networks so as to allow communication and exchange of data content between them, such use is not considered to be a patent infringement. So we were trying to make things easier for, for, um, um, for small developers and open source. Uh, Ms. McCarthy also advocated that the European Union should look into the introduction of grace periods, which is something which we haven't got in Europe. As, as you know here, it's first to invent in Europe, it's first to file. So any disclosure of your invention before you file, you start filing, could mean you lose your patent. So we would think it would be a good idea to consider this. Unfortunately, the European Patent Convention is an international convention to which, uh, which includes signatories from non-EU countries, so the only way it can be changed is by intergovernmental conference. So then it had to go to the plenary session of Parliament, and this is where the trouble started, in that members have been lent on very heavily by the open source community and if you look in the, the document that was finally adopted in the plenary session it includes a reference to a very old German case which is called Rota Tauber which refers to the forces of nature the use of natural forces to control physical effects beyond the digital representation of information constitutes a field of technology. They go on to say that the processing, handling, and presentation of information do not belong to a field of technology. A further article says that member states shall ensure that data processing is not considered to be a field of technology within the meaning of patent law, and that innovations in the field of data processing are not considered to be innovations, inv inventions within the meaning of patent law. So if you think about that, that was a 100% victory for the open source movement. Um, uh, interestingly, it would probably preclude patenting an entirely new form of computer since it rules out data processing from patenting at all. So what happened then? The council then produced its common position, which is almost identical to Ms. McCarthy's report as presented in the Legal Affairs Committee, with certain, certain gestures made also towards open source. So the council reached agreement, political agreement, on the 17th of May 2004. What this usually means is that at the next council meeting, it is passed as an A point on the agenda, which means that it's not debated. It just is adopted as it is. However, the pressures were such that the common position was not adopted until the 7th of March 2005. And this followed attempts by national parliaments in Germany, the Netherlands, Spain and Denmark to get their governments to withdraw their consent. Now this put the, the in the EU, the presidency of the council rotates every six months. The presidency at the moment are the Luxem is the Luxembourgers and they were faced with a dilemma. We've got all these guys saying, you know, we said yes a couple of months ago, now we've changed our minds. If everybody could do this all the time, you'd never reach a decision on anything with 25 member states. So the Luxembourgers reluctantly had it adopted as an A point, and it is now on the table and awaiting the final reading in the European Parliament. This has been described by open source as uh, illegal, um, constituting a constitutional crisis and whatever. In fact, the uh, Legal Affairs Committee itself was so upset about this that it called on the council to start the whole process from square one all over again. Uh, this the council refused to do. The parliament also put pressure on the European Commission to withdraw its proposal. Interestingly, the commission can withdraw its proposal at any stage in the proceedings up to the last conciliation procedure. The European Commission, which is having a hard time for other reasons, decided that this would be a sign of weakness and refused to do so. So where are we now? This is where we are. The Legal Affairs Committee has yet to sit and deliberate. It now has a new rapporteur 
Michel Rocard, former French Prime Minister, who produced an opinion for the Legal Affairs Committee which was very, very, very much in favour of open source. There are two, well, for a start, what happens if they fail to reach agreement? We are left with the status quo. The European Patent Office can go on issuing patents for virtually business methods, as it, if it's, that is true that it's done so. If you go on the software, uh, the open source people's internet site, you can see examples of what they call a horror, horror gallery of horrors of patents which have been granted for pure business methods. So it's not really an open source's interest either not to have any legislation. Though they seem to be, you know, they say there are all these unlawful patents around. I said to one of them the other day, well, why don't you bring a test case? You know, why don't you mount a test against one of these, a case against one of these in the traditional way and see what happens? Perhaps they will. If we go along with the Commission's approach, um, how could we make it more watertight? Well, one way would be to try and raise the hurdle for inventive step, which would involve the revision of the examination guidelines in Munich at the European Patent Organization. That's certainly a possibility, but it's probably not enough. Um, one thing that Arlene McCarthy adverted to in her report, which has been favorably accepted, is, as I mentioned, the idea of having grace periods, which would be a certain amount of help, and then to grant more help to small and medium-sized software developers. And given the costs of obtaining a patent in Europe, a European patent is also made more complicated, more expensive by the fact that you have translation costs, which are very, very expensive, and then the costs of actually defending your patent when you get it. So we felt that the European Patent Office is sitting on a, a huge chest of money. Uh, you know, why not dig into some of that, which is another possibility. You know, the whole, but the, for me, the whole question, and the, the question I'd dearly love to be able to solve is, you know, what is an invention in this area? You know, that seems to me the crux of it. You know, I'm a great admirer of the open source movement. I have um, my firewall is open source. I use um, Firefox rather than, you know, and I think it's, it's, it's you know, a highly laudable venture. But it's now, as the previous speakers pointed out, it's now become big business. You know, I've been lobbied by people that are, you know, hunting with a, uh, hunting, with a hunting with a hare, running with a hare and uh, running with a fox and hunting with a, with, a, with a huntsman. You know, that they're on both sides. Like IBM have been very, very vociferous in lobbying in favor of this directive. It wants patents. And then I get members of parliament coming to say, my, you know, my son is a, is a Linux enthusiast. You know, and these guys are mugs. You know, they're working for nothing for IBM and, you know, the big American corporations. And then, of course, the whole thing has got the attraction for politicians of it's Bill Gates versus thousands of Robin Hoods in Europe. You know, what, what more exciting political, attractive and simple political issue could you find? Anyway, whatever ensues, I'm sure you will follow this with uh, great interest in the States, even though your patent system is different. We follow what's going on over here with fascination. It's all your fault anyway. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. If anybody's got any questions or detailed questions afterwards, I'd please to answer them on a one-to-one -one basis or whatever. Thank you. I want to thank both uh, Daniel and Robert uh, for, for, for setting me up here. Um, uh, Robert would appreciate that uh, in, in, over the last several months I have, uh, I think I've got a room named after me now at the Hotel Stephanie Bristol in Brussels. I've been over there so many times. Um, and it's uh, <laughs> the greatest amount of time I've had to spend has been trying to understand the legislative process in Europe, which is, which is a bit of a challenge. Um, I'm going to uh, maybe be a, a bit more incendiary here, um, uh, not that we don't have a, a, enough to talk about already. Uh, I, I do want to reflect for a second on the, on the fact that one of your speakers this afternoon, Dave Harlow, is 
is in fact my legal mentor, uh, also is a legal mentor for a, a good friend, uh, Skip London. Skip, for those of you who don't know him, is a general counsel at Static Control, which has been very active in the uh, litigation with Lexmark involving the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, of course, I'm at Red Hat and uh, challenging intellectual properties, boundaries uh, every day. Uh, to know Dave is to know that Dave is a relatively conservative <coughs> individual. Uh, the one thing, the one trait he passed on to both Skip and I is you don't have to accept convention. As I get started, I, I have a question for you. This is going to be participatory. Um, and I want you to just uh, go with your initial reaction. Don't stop to think about the question a whole lot. But uh, let me know how many of you believe that patents are vital to innovation in the field of pharmaceuticals? Hands up. I, you know, I'm right there with you. Now, how many of you uh, or how many of us here also believe that they're vital to innovation in the field of computer software? Hands up. And how many of you believe that Microsoft would, have, would have not achieved their monopoly status on the desktop but for patents? Anybody? No, no hands going up. Uh, well, in, in essence, that confirms my point uh, that, uh, that I want to drive home today, which is first and foremost, if I leave you with nothing else, it's that patents are not critical to innovation in software. That's just bunk. Um, I've asked colleagues with uh, a number of the major firms that have been very active in the, in the CII directive debate in Europe to provide me with a single, a single empirical study that says that patents are an inducement to innovation in software, and I have yet to see one. And yet, if you'll read the paper that I provide, I can point you to a number of empirical studies done by scholars in this country and elsewhere that in fact uh, challenge that assumption, that basic assumption. And just to, to graphically display this, um, this is all information taken right from uh, Microsoft's website uh, having to do with, uh, and it's displayed on a logarithmic scale here just so you can see relationships, but you can see a high correlation between Microsoft's revenues between 1985 and 1999. And by the way, it cut, took 1999 as a cutoff date here simply because I can't easily identify the number of patents that they filed since 1999. High correlation, almost a perfect correlation between R&D spending and their growth and revenue. But if you look at the chart, what you see is that up until 1994, there was no correlation between patents being filed and R&D spending. And in fact, they had filed fewer than 250 patents at that point in time, and yet it was at that point in time, 1994, that it was recognized, I think, that, uh, that they had uh, effectively put themselves in a position of having established a, a monopoly within the browser field and, and effectively on the desktop, uh, well on the way to establishing one on the desktop. As was pointed out before by Daniel, you know, we haven't ended up where we are today, and I think Artie may, may have made mention to this earlier too, that, that we haven't ended up where we are today because of a legislative process. Congress did not sit down like they did with copyright in the CONTU study and say, should we have patents that apply to software? We have ended up here by judicial fiat. And none of us have spent a great deal of time going back and looking and saying, is this system, in fact, working? Is it the best way to protect software? And I would advocate that, in fact, it doesn't work very well. In fact, uh, my good friend Mr. Gates uh, would probably have agreed with me about 14 years ago when he recognized that patents were a potential threat to the software industry. Or maybe, in fact, they were a significant opportunity for Microsoft to go forward and protect a position that they had already established. 
It's interesting to reflect back that if we had had software patents in the 1970s, those innovations that all of us use on the desktop, which would have just come off patent about five years ago, the word processor, the spreadsheet, and the presentation graphics features would have been tied up for 20 years. But thank goodness people like Dan Bricklin, who uh, came up with the idea for VisiCalc, uh, chose, I mean, Dan had considered at the time whether he should seek patent protection, and he was advised that he was wasting his time uh, and chose not to. But it's interesting where we would be today, where our technology would be today, had that occurred. So why are patents and software such a problem? Uh, just to graphically demonstrate this. I've gone and looked at the number of patents that apply to two blockbuster drugs. Uh, well known, <coughs> not to me personally, I will say, but uh, 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 Pfizer's Viagra and Merck's Zocor. Uh, if you look, there are basically three core patents that cover each of those pharmaceuticals. So if a generic manufacturer is going to come along and wants to compete, they have to examine three basic patents to be able to figure out how to do so. Uh, at least from an intellectual property standpoint. And yet, if you want to compete in the software field, Microsoft has 14 patents on the positioning and movement of a cursor and two more pending applications that have published. 16 patents just on that one tiny feature. So what we've got uh, that have developed are these vast thickets of patents in the software arena that those of us who are attempting to compete are having to deal with. And it is a complex issue, as, as Daniel's pointed out. It's going to be interesting to see how it plays out, but we're starting to now see other um, elements start to develop. First are the patent pools. Uh, if you follow this area, you, you've seen companies like Intellectual Ventures prop, uh, crop up now. Uh, JGR, these are companies that their sole purpose, they don't make anything. Their sole purpose is to go out and buy up patents primarily on software and business methods, own those, and then seek to license them to others. Perfectly legal. Um, but you're going to see more and more of those entities crop up as we go forward. You're seeing vast cross licenses, especially among the major players, whether IBM, Hewlett Packard, Sun, Intel, AMD, uh, Microsoft, cross licenses where they basically all the big boys look at each other and say, well, you know, we don't really want to get involved in litigation among ourselves. Um, but those small companies where the innovation is typically cropping up are not players in that field. You're seeing companies like Red Hat, uh, and it is a fundamental part of our, our policy to oppose the concept of software patents. But you're seeing companies like Red Hat go and obtain patents for defensive purposes. Now, we've made those patents available to the open source community. I was, I was tickled to death to see IBM make their move back in January and, and make 500 patents available. Of course, you know, it's sort of the, the old story of the, of the pig and the chicken talking about breakfast and the, and the pig telling the chicken that, you know, you're a participant, but I'm committed. Um, uh, IBM is a participant, 500 patents out of 40,000 patents is not the same as, as, as what Red Hat has done. On the other hand, I don't have 40,000 patents. Red Hat has made its patent portfolio available to the open source community so long as the code is written under one of the restrictive, some would say viral, open source licenses to ensure that the code remains open. That's allowed us to retain the portfolio for purposes of defending ourselves and bringing claims against those who would seek uh, to, to assert patents against us. You're seeing concepts like uh, some of the, uh, the terminology now is patent trolls, uh, patent terrorists. Um, you know, what is a patent terrorist? 
it's somebody who sues, sues me for patent infringement. Uh, <laughs> and it doesn't make any difference how big they are. But uh, basically, what they're talking about are small entities, no viable business, immune to counterclaims, seeking to extract large sums of money out of uh, industry participants, and their most prominent victim is typically Microsoft. For the very reason Daniel said, under the Willie Sutton theory, you, you go where the money is. What we are approaching now starts to look like the Cold War. You're having parties line up. Um, certain elements of it look like mutually assured destruction. And we're into an arms race. You're going to have entities going out and competing to acquire as many patents as they can. The price of patents will escalate regardless of their inherent value. And that's where one of the big questions is, is what are the, uh, where does the inherent value in patents lie? Uh, as Daniel pointed out, a large number of patents are found to be invalid if they actually get to trial. Uh, a lot of them don't even get that far. I wanted to come back to this chart just for a second because as you see, we've got this high correlation and actually after 94, a relatively good correlation between the number of patent applications that Microsoft has been filing and their R&D spending. And yet last summer, Bill Gates announced that they're going to increase the number of patents they're filing from 2,000 to 3,000 a year, a 50% increase. Now, I, I will tell you that the correlation between revenue and R&D spending isn't going to change, and the basic slope of those two lines has not changed. But all of a sudden, we're going to see a drastic change in the slope of the number of patents being filed to where it crosses over the line uh, for R&D spending. Because he did not announce a 50% increase in R&D spending or a 50% increase in the number of engineers. I call this the same block of cheese, just thinner slices. Or uh, another way of looking at it is just more nails in the highway for competitors to run over. Because the patents are hard to identify, they're hard to associate with specific technologies, they're costly to evaluate, and they're extraordinarily expensive to litigate. So they start uh, taking a page out of, uh, out of their good buddies at SCO. Microsoft starts a whispering campaign and going out and calling on customers and saying, we think Linux infringes, and you know, all you got to do is pay us some money and we won't come after you. Um, and, and our good friends, our customers say, well, which ones? And Microsoft says, well, you know, I can't show you unless you sign an NDA. Well, okay, what's your NDA say? Well, it says that I will show them to you, but you won't disclose them to anybody else and you won't in, in, uh, disclose them to your outside counsel as well. Well, that's certainly a rather novel, novel approach to uh, the law in the U.S. And all of this has brought about uh, a situation where is confrontation coming? Yeah. Is it going to be Microsoft coming after an end user directly or Microsoft coming after Red Hat directly? No. I'm going to tell you I don't believe that's what's going to happen because that's not Microsoft's MO, nor can they afford to take that, uh, take that stance. They know quite well how vulnerable their patent portfolio is, how weak it is. So my prediction is we will see a new term crop up, and this one is patent, the patent assassin. It will be a front company, uh, not Microsoft, it will seek to go after a Linux user, but not a prominent Linux user. Uh, I would say a classic example would be, in fact, the SCO case against AutoZone. They'll pick somebody who they feel is in, an, is in a poor position to defend and have this side attack so that Microsoft can then look at them and say, see, we told you it was infringing. Those guys are having this battle over here. That's where we're headed. I've mentioned uh, some of the, the uh, uh, reports cited in my paper, the Besson and Hunt uh, study. Uh, it concludes or uh, identifies that, um, that in fact, software patents are, are perhaps not uh, in the in interest of the software industry. 
Brownwell Hall, Brownwell Hall at uh, UCAL Berkeley confirms that inexpensive weak patents are an inhibiting factor in industries such as software where one, fil where one feature builds on the next. Excuse me, Mark, I have a message from our student master. You move this okay, I, I'm, I'm just about to the end here. Um, just wanted to uh, bring us back to what brought us here in the first place, that we need to remember that there is a public interest involved in intellectual property, and that that public interest needs to come first, not last. And even somebody as eminent as Andy Grove has recognized that our system is not working as well as it might. So where do we, where do we go from here? First is going to be reforming the patent system. We're looking at that, that uh, possibility now in Europe, and, and I'll make a prediction. We will see a directive in Europe. It will take into account uh, interoperability, assuring that interoperability can take place. I'll also make another prediction, and that's that the key component to that legislation is the concept of what constitutes a technical contribution right now that is left to the courts of the individual countries in Europe. It, that is the hardest thing to try and define, but I believe there will be a definition of that and it will set a standard. We will see patent reform in the U.S. The Senate is lining up its, uh, the, its uh, hearings, the first of which will take place next Thursday. Uh, 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 Mr. Dudas will be testifying before Congress on reform. This list, this list is all things that Red Hat would support as far as reforming the system. Interestingly enough, everything on that list was, uh, was advanced also by Brad Smith of Microsoft. The only place where we will see a difference of opinion will be on harmonization because I believe Mr. Smith will want to see the rest of the world harmonize on the U.S. Red Hat will insist that what we need to do in the U.S. is harmonize on Europe, that they will set a much better standard for what should take place. Finally, I, and I leave this for you to think about, if we had to start over, what system would we have for protecting software other than copyright, patent, and trade secret? And I'd suggest that it would be a shorter term of protection, protection only for complete systems or features, not small components to avoid the trivial, strong protection to, uh, uh, to reward the first mover published source code so others can see what they've done and can uh, develop upon it, and an assurance that we will have interoperability. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here uh, and spend my 15 minutes defending the patent system against people whose jobs it appears to be to attack it. Uh, I don't know how effective I'll be, but uh, there are some things that I think are worth considering when you start uh, considering redoing the patent system. Or, and the first step, I think, is to figure out how we got here. And so that we're talking of the same language, what we have is a, a, a patents are a limited duration monopoly granted by the government to someone who invents something. And in general, I think people think monopolies are evil. So why is it that the government uh, ended up granting monopolies to people uh, for their inventions? And it wasn't. Uh, the result of lobbying of big business. It wasn't Microsoft or IBM paying a bunch of campaign contributions to people. Uh, it wasn't foreign countries or foreign companies who get a lot of patents giving uh, a bunch of money to Congress. It was actually the Founding Fathers, as has been mentioned early, earlier, that considered patents or the protection of intellectual property something important enough to include in the Constitution of the United States. 
Article 1, Section 8, and it's not the Commerce Clause part of the Constitution. It's the enumerated powers of Congress part of the Constitution. Uh, Article 1, Section 8 is that Congress shall have the authority to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times exclusive rights to, to writings and discoveries. And I think there's two important parts of that. It's progress and exclusive rights. So why does an exclusive right, why would the founding fathers think an exclusive right would promote progress? I think there's two basic theories behind why exclusive rights promote progress. And the first is typically called the uh, economic incentive of exclusivity. And that is you reward the inventors by providing them that exclusive time period when they're the only ones who get to use their invention. So that provides a direct monetary incentive to inventors to use their invention. They have exclusivity in the marketplace to either exploit the invention themselves or they can bargain away their exclusivity with licensing, agreement, licensing agreements, either uh, exclusive or non-exclusive licenses. So the result of that exclusivity is there's a direct incentive for inventors to invent. But there's also a second factor, and that is everyone else who isn't an inventor. They have an incentive to invent because they can't do what the inventors already come up with. If you're first, you get the right to do it yourself, but no one else does. So in order to, if you want to be a player in that marketplace, you have to come up with something different. You have to design around that existing invention. And in the United States, that design around has to be more than an insubstantial difference in order to not be an infringement, which in and of itself says that you have to have a substantial difference from the patented invention in order to have a successful design around. So in addition to the exclusivity providing an incentive to inventors to invent, it provides an incentive to non-inventors to invent, <clears throat> and that, that can result in further invention. But also, another key word in the Constitution is progress. What is, what is progress? I would submit that progress, and it can be broken into two categories of innovation and development. And I think the patent system is intended to promote innovation as opposed to development. Innovation is bringing something new, advancing the ball, moving, the, moving science forward. Development is providing something practical or useful, and it's not necessarily innovative. Writing a new device driver for a CD-ROM may be a nice development, may be practical, may be useful, but it isn't necessarily an innovation. So the patent laws promote innovation, not development. And, and how do we know that? Well, there are some characteristics of the patent law that you can look at that say, lead to the conclusion that it's innovation, not development, that, it, that the current laws are trying to promote. The first is that there's no requirement for the patentee to actually have built anything to file a patent. There's no reduction to practice requirement. Filing the patent application itself is what we call a constructive reduction to practice. And so there's no necessity of the inventor to actually have built something. No model requirement, no working prototype. The other thing is that the patent has to be sufficiently, has to sufficiently disclose the invention so that one of skill in the art could practice the invention without undue experimentation. So the patent law itself assumes that, there, that the disclosure doesn't have to be uh, a mechanical drawing sufficient to manufacture the, a manufacturing drawing uh, or the source code specifically. Uh, but it, it contemplates the fact that there may be experimentation within that of skill, with, within the realm of those of skill in the art uh, that may be needed in order to actually do an implementation of the actual invention. So again, you don't have to have it fully developed, and, and you don't have to disclose it in a way that, that is fully developed. There's also no working requirement in the United States. And a working requirement in many countries is the requirement that the, in order to maintain the exclusivity of the patent, uh, that the inventor 
has to have implemented it and it be in a product or in, in, that, in a particular country. Uh, if after so many years after the patent issues, there's no working of the patent in the country, then the uh, patentee may lose their exclusivity. There's no such working requirement in the United States. Likewise, there's no compulsory license provision in the United States patent laws other than the compulsory license that the government gets. Uh, so with the... Uh, uh, there's no obligation, either with, with respect to a working uh, requirement or not, uh, that the patentee uh, grant a license to anyone else. So how does the patent system promote innovation? Uh, it balances this limited duration exclusivity with the benefit of public disclosure. Because after all, if in the absence of filing the patent application, the inventor could just keep their invention a secret. And I think Microsoft, or especially in software, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, I guess you could decompile code, but you can keep, it's why the, the focus seems to be on uh, disclosure of source code, that it may be difficult to figure out what someone is doing just from the compiled code itself. But what the patentee gives up, or what the patent is, that they have to publicly disclose their invention. So what does the patentee get for this public disclosure? They get the injunction against infringement to maintain their exclusivity. And there's a whole lot of different theories you can get infringement under, literal, contributory, inducing. And even if they, uh, and, the, and under the doctrine of equivalence, which says that uh, unless it's a substantial, if it's merely an insubstantial difference between what's claimed and what is the accused infringing product, uh, that doesn't avoid infringement. They also have a minimum damages of a, of a reasonable royalty. Even if the patentee isn't, isn't building anything, isn't doing anything, uh, they're entitled to a reasonable royalty for their invention. But that's not the only damage they can receive because there's also other damages, theories that can be uh, asserted, including lost profits, convoy sales, and price erosion as a result of the infringement. Typically, each of those require the patentee to actually be uh, selling a product that's covered by the patented invention. But uh, there are a number of damages theories. Those are just examples that they can be a monetary recovery. And it was briefly mentioned earlier that the patentee can get enhanced damages for willful infringement. If someone infringes a patent, is aware of a patent, and either indifferently infringes it or knowingly infringes it, then uh, that person can be found guilty of willful infringement. And the willful infringement can result in up to treble damages and an award of attorney's fees. In fact, willful infringement is an intentional tort, which can't be uh, extinguished through bankruptcy. Well, there's a lot that the patentee gets with respect to exclusivity. But what does the public get in order to grant this exclusivity? Well, they get this public disclosure. They get the patentee to tell them what they could otherwise keep secret. And in that public disclosure, it has to be enabling. It has to teach someone how to practice the invention. Uh, it has to also disclose the best mode. The patentee can't keep secret the best way of carrying out the invention if he believes there is one. And then ultimately, the invention itself is published in the patent. And then it's also only a limited duration after which uh, the public the invention is in the public domain. And it's 20 years from the time of filing. But in the United States, uh, there are maintenance fee requirements, as there are in most places around the world, annuity requirements, where if the maintenance fees are not paid and they escalate with time, the patent expires and the invention is put into the public domain. Typically, uh, my understanding is from IBM's latest announcements that they have 5,000 patents a year that come up for maintenance fee, of which 1,500 they expire. So of the 5,000 that could, almost a third end uh, before their 20-year duration. And that inf that, uh, those inventions are then placed in the public domain. So after it expires, anyone is free to use that unless use the invention unless it's covered by 
some other patent. So in essence, with respect to the patents, the patentee gets this limited duration exclusive right and the public gets the disclosure of the invention, which the patentee wouldn't, otherwise wouldn't have to do, and then they ultimately get the invention. And that's essentially the basis for why uh, the patent system is believed to be to spur innovation. But well, I think we, let me try and catch up here. Uh, we'll s s skip quickly through the open source stuff, as opposed to open source which I think is more aimed at development. It's a software license agreement, and th those are typical characteristics of it as defined by the open source initiative. But what does it do? It facilitates development and use. It, it removes the copyright as an impediment to modification and redistribution of the software. You know, it facilitates modification by re requiring that the source code be available so that people in the community will know, will be able to uh, directly modify the source code. And it expands the community by allow by, uh, of users and developers by providing for this redistribution and modification. And it relies on the copyright principles for that. What doesn't it do? Well, it doesn't require any innovation. There's no, in order to use the open source software, you can just use it. There's no requirement that you come up with anything new. Uh, there's no requirement that you provide further development. There's no direction provided for that development, unlike the patent system where the direction is you have to go away from what is already patented. Uh, you, the development could be something that's that's meaningless to most people. Uh, and there's no incentive provided simply by open source for further development. It also doesn't, as I think has been clear already, doesn't guarantee you the right to use that software. Uh, it, copyright applies to ideas, not, or to the expression of those ideas, not to the ideas themselves. Uh, so merely by having the copyright to software doesn't mean that you still wouldn't violate someone's patent. And it also typically doesn't provide indemnification or warranties as uh, for the actual developer or distributor. And as I think has been clear already, shifts that burden to the user. Uh, so what are some issues that seem to be popping up with open source? I think the basic question is, is it enforceable? Uh, and SCO has argued that it's not. Uh, Will it be uniformly applied? It's based on copyright and contract, and copyright differs from district to district. So what may be a copyright infringement in one district might not be in another, especially in the case of software. Uh, <clears throat> does it really need to be uniformly enforced, or is lack of enforcement can be treated like a restrictive covenant, covenant in a homeowner's association, and your lack of enforcing the, uh, the open source uh, agreement, is it going to be considered a waiver? Does it, and I think this is clear, can taint your proprietary software? How viral is it? How much code do you need in order to make your otherwise proprietary code, and companies are scared to death of this, turn your proprietary code into open source code? Uh, so, uh, and that may, again, vary based on jurisdiction. And then there's a lot of different, open source is just kind of a, a buzzword that brings in a lot of different license agreements, uh, trying to make up some set of rules to comply with all of them can be very difficult, if not impossible. So essentially, uh, to get us started on the discussion and to let everybody go, we've got patents, they've been around a long time, since the founding of the country. They provide direct incentives to patentees and non-patentees to innovate as opposed to merely develop. And it provides, in exchange for that, that trade-off of public access to the inventions. And open source, primarily in my mind, is viewed is something which facilitates development by removing copyright impediments to it and expanding the facility and has a lot of open issues with respect to uh, how it's going to be enforced, who would enforce it and what the ultimate outcome will be.
I am the last speaker of whom we heard in the first talk. Uh, by the time I start, I've been done for five minutes. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I, Welcome to my world. <laughs> I am instructed, as the English barristers say, to do a uh, short but excellent version of uh, my talk and then uh, steal just a little bit of time from the discussion. And I'm going to hit this one to advance. This guy's been managing my life for years. I've never been able to teach a Duke without him. Okay, uh, I want to talk uh, a little bit in an effort to tie together some of the legal issues that have been underlying much of what we've heard so far. Uh, why we're all here, I think, is the State Street case in 1998. And in this country, uh, and I think to a lesser extent in Europe, the law of software patents is inextricably tied to business method patents. Those have been categories that uh, have been married uh, from the beginning. Uh, State Street, as you all know, in 1998, uh, did a couple of things on these fronts. The judicially created so-called business method exception to statutory subject matter uh, is laid to rest, having been ill-conceived to start with. Who knew? Uh, second point of State Street is that a computerized process that yields a useful, concrete, and tangible result constitutes patentable subject matter. Uh, let's see, what am I doing wrong here? I'll do it with that? Okay, all right. Uh, it has long been the case in this country, long, long been the case, that business machines and business-related industrial processes have been patented. Knees, 1815, uh, Hollerith, the precursor of IBM uh, back in 1889 with his mechanical punch card system. Uh, the critical case in this history is uh, 1908, the Hotel Security Checking Company versus Lorraine. Second Circuit, a hotel bookkeeping system which used cash registering and account checking to prevent fraud. Where are these guys now that we really need them? The court held a system of transacting business disconnected from the means for carrying out the system is not an art, what we'd now call a process. Uh, this is actually, uh, I think, prescient, perhaps, with, the res with respect to uh, the state of European law now. Uh, read this case. Ask yourself, is it a subject matter case? Is it a novelty case? Is it an unobvious case? And uh, call me and tell me when you figure that out. I'm not sure. Uh, this rule eroded uh, from 1908 until 1998. Uh, it eroded as business methods became synonymous with computerization, as novel business methods uh, were almost by definition computerized. The Supreme Court as it often does, uh, created a lot of confusion. 1978 in Fluke, uh, we're told that a method for calculating an alarm limit using a computer as a result of which we shut down a catalytic converter is not patentable subject matter. And three years later, we're told in Deere that a method for operating a rubber curing process, wherein you use a computer to calculate an alarm limit and then shut the thing down is patentable subject matter. Uh, patent lawyers, uh, not being asleep at the switch, uh, read this as saying, well, just hide the software in a conventional machine or process, and you're OK. And indeed, they were. And lurking in the background in this country was the mathematical algorithm morass. In some sense, mathematical algorithms were not patentable, are not patentable. Uh, State Street comes along. And the invention here, a data processing system for managing a financial services configuration uh, of a portfolio, et cetera, et cetera. District court rejected this as a business method and an unpatentable mathematical calculation. Uh, Federal Circuit says it is not an unpatentable abstract, that's the bad kind, algorithm or calculation, so long as it produces a useful, concrete, and tangible result. So all you have to do is kick out a number and you have patentable subject matter. 
a final share price. And the business method objective of the whole thing is irrelevant. OK, uh, let's switch very quickly to Europe. Uh, the European Patent Office, the European Patent Convention, Article 52. A European patent, as most of you know, is not really a European patent. It's a bundle of national patents which are enforced under potentially different standards by national courts. It's as if in the United States the PTO applied one set of standards to give you a patent, and then you had to go to state courts to enforce it, and they were allowed to create state patent law. Okay, subject matter, European patents shall be granted for any inventions which are susceptible of industrial application, read utility, which are new, read new, and which involve an inventive step, read non-obviousness. All right, uh, these things are not inventions within the meaning of what I just read. Uh, discoveries, scientific theories, mathematical methods, schemes, rules, methods for performing mental acts, playing games, or doing business, and programs for computers. Enough said, right? No, not exactly. Uh, the two most important words in European patent law appear at the end here. The provisions of the thing we just looked at shall not exclude patentability, uh, et cetera, et cetera, only to the extent to which uh, shall exclude patentability, only to the extent to which a European patent relates to such forbidden subject matter or activities as such. So what are computer programs as such the essential question in European software patent law? Uh, what does as such mean? Well, the EPO said this. Uh, methods for doing business programs for computers are as such explicitly excluded. A product or a method which is of a technical character the second two most important words, technical character, may be patentable, even if the claim subject matter defines or at least involves a business method, a computer program, et cetera. So technical character, or as it's sometimes put, technicity, is critical. Guides for examination, uh, a scheme for learning a language, a method of solving uh, crossword puzzles, a game, organizing a commercial operation, not patentable. Uh, however, if the claim subject matter spec specifies an apparatus or technical process, does that mean that the uh, European patent would be granted on a rubber curing process whose only novel element is software? That would suggest so. Uh, guidelines on computer programs in the case of a method specifying technical means for a purely non-technical purpose does not necessarily confer technical character. So not terribly helpful. But on the other hand, we're up to about the fourth hand now, a computer system, back to Diamond versus Deer, suitably programmed for use in a particular field, even if that's business, has the character of a concrete apparatus and is thus an invention. So in Europe, we are trying to distinguish between software patented as software and some sort of technical implementation of what the software does. Uh, cases, Sohai, 1994, a computer system for plural types of independent management, including at least financial and inventory management, not unlike the State Street claim, could not be excluded. It had adequate technical character because the file handling needs a knowledge of the capacities of the computer. A charming anthropomorphism there. But the file handling needs a knowledge of the capacities of the computer. So that is technical. And the ultimate business purpose, irrelevant. Uh, benef pension benefit systems, 2000. A method of controlling a pension benefits program. Very State Street-like. Rejected. Does not go beyond a method of doing business as such. But another claim. This is reminiscent of the fluke deer dichotomy, an apparatus for controlling a pension benefit system. That's upheld. Is the European Patent Office uh, setting a drafting problem for European patent lawyers as the Supreme Court set for ours? Uh, comment on inventive step or non-obviousness. In the US, non-obviousness doesn't have to lie in a technical area. 
State Street makes that clear. Obvious computer implementation of a non-obvious business, business method, however, will fail in Europe. An EU consultation paper, the fact that the technical contribution also has to be non-obvious, important limitation. So to the extent there is a material distinction in the present state of EPC law and US law, I think it may lie here. Non-obviousness non must lie in a technical area. Uh, some more recent cases, Comvic, Rico, Hitachi, all from the Board of Appeals of the European Patent Office, and all affirm rejections of software and or business methods inventions. Uh, they rely on obviousness and or a lack of technical contribution. And the hint to be taken here, I think, is that the EPO may be tightening up and that clever drafting may not suffice. EU news. Uh, the EU patent, that is the real European patent, as opposed to the European Patent Convention bundle, uh, remains sidetracked. Uh, originally sidetracked uh, on the issue of court jurisdiction, now sidetracked uh, on the issue of language. Uh, a wonderful issue to an anthropologist. Remarkable. Uh, the proposed directive, uh, we've heard about that from Mr. Bray. Uh, the commentary that comes out of Europe uh, is that the EU, people in the EU believe that under the directive, outcomes will differ in significant ways from those uh, in the US. And by the way, the uh, adoption of the common position on the directive, uh, if you look at the European commentary, uh, there is, as Mr. Bray suggested, uh, a great amount of weeping and gnashing of teeth, casting out into the darkness and all that kind of stuff. Uh, well, let me wind up uh, on the practical question of whether software patents are bad, in ironic postmodernist quotes, whatever that means. I pulled together, and you students know that what that means is I had some students pull together, uh, a bunch of recent law and economics work uh, on software patents, see what uh, that crowd has to say. And the studies are mixed, as one might expect from law and economics. 15% uh, of all recent patents, according to one study, are software patents, which is astonishing. I don't know whether it's good or bad. We can stipulate it's astonishing. Uh, another study says two-thirds of software patents are acquired by large firms for strategic purposes. Uh, only 5% belong to software publishers. Yet another study trying to come up with proxies for quality, number of claims, number of prior art citations, uh, frequency at which it's litigated. Uh, this study concludes that software patents are not different in quality from non-software patents by these measures, which are imprecise proxy variables. And yet another study suggests that software patents are more often litigated than non-software patents. Where does this leave us? Uh, is this much ado about nothing, or is the sky falling? Uh, those of you who have taken a course from me, and a few of you are here, oddly, you came back for more, uh, know that in most areas of intellectual property, I am a Coasean. Coase won the Nobel Prize for theorizing that uh, Regardless of the rule of law, people in the market will arrive at the most efficient allocation of resources. And he did that with an elaborate hypothetical about farmers and ranchers and uh, crops getting trampled and fences and that sort of thing. And I've always been pretty much a Kosian when it comes to intellectual property. I was a protagonist, have remained a protagonist, in the incredible mood swings of software copyright law. And the world ended many times, but the industry seemed not to notice as we went back from protecting, swung back and forth from protecting everything to protecting just about nothing. Uh, are software patents different? Will they prove to be cosian? Will industry achieve an efficient allocation and continue to prosper? Uh, and I guess the, the question is, are patents different? Uh, are they? qualitatively different from other forms of protection. And that brings us back around to Coase, 
because as the only thing you know about one has to know about economics is that everything begins assuming. And the Coase theorem begins assuming no transaction costs. Well, are patents the ultimate transaction costs that we won't be able to overcome without a huge loss of efficiency? Uh, I doubt it, but I don't know. I think these people do. And after we take about a 10-minute break, we'll come back at 11 o'clock and uh, argue these and other points. Yeah.